A very good day to you. I'm Professor Sharada Srinivasan from the National Institute of Advanced Studies here in Bangalore. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity from the India International Center to present a talk, online talk, on the very fascinating and rich topic of art and technology of South Indian bronzes and the Chola Nataraja. And I have been engaged over the past three decades now, um, going back to my doctoral work at the Institute of Archaeology in London and thereafter also in uh, Nias, Bangalore, on the topic of exploring metal technology and art history in innovative ways of these very magnificent icons. And I shall now continue to share my screen. I think now you can see, yes, um, I just need to go to the top of my presentation. Well, the Chola bronzes from um, southern India represent a very wonderful metallurgical tradition, and they are a marvelous synthesis of art and technology in many ways. Um, bringing together diverse strands that also connect with uh, devotional poetry, performance, dance, and um, philosophical and ideological and ritual aspects and so on. And as mentioned, I have been looking at um, aspects of the archaeometallurgical study of the um, metal content and also the linking with the art historical aspects, what we describe these days as technical art history. Well, the uh, tradition of bronzes, of course, has a certain history in the Indian subcontinent. The earliest known um, metal figurine is the celebrated dancing girl from Mohenjo-daro in uh, of the Harappan context dated to about 2500 BCE. So this idea of uh, the dancing figurine is something which has a uh, long-standing uh, connection, although of course there is a market hiatus in the post-Harappan period until about the early historic period, but there are these finds which do form interesting aspects of uh, strands, very slender strands, even if they are of continuity. For example, from the later up in context, there is a fine elephant from Daimabad, which has this base, which has certain holes. And it also reminds one of the holes that would have been used, for example, to uh, carry the processional South Indian metal icons, the Utsava Murti. Um, so it brings to mind the connotation of that sort of function. And there is also an intriguing figurine of the mother goddess in Adi Chinalur, uh, dated to about 800 BCE, which has echoes of the Harappan terracotta mother goddesses. There is also a metal figurine of a tiger found from Kodumanal of the megalithic period of about 3rd century BCE. And that is also inlaid with lapis lazuli and carnelian. And certainly lapis lazuli has a connection with the northwest of India again um, to be found in Afghanistan and so on. So, um, and we also have this intriguing uh, set of vessels from Iron Age context, such as the one that we're seeing at, at Adichinalur, which has uh, what looks to be these floppy-eared goats forming uh, the finial. And uh, the hair to the bun on one side of the Mohenjo-daro dancing girl also has echoes in many of the local and indigenous practices, such as of the Kota women of the Nilgiris in Tamil Nadu. Well, the imperial cholas were great patrons 
in the 9th and 10th century, uh, 10th to 11th century and so on. And they cast very spectacular bronzes and also built magnificent temples such as the celebrated Bhradishwara temple, which was consecrated by Raj Raja Shoran in about 1010 CE. And this temple famously has uh, numerous inscriptions which had mentioned 60 metal icons, but only two of these are now found extant in the temple. The uh, beautiful set that you're looking at in the middle, which is still in worship, depicting Ardavalan or Nataraja, the Hindu god of dance, who was the Kula Devata or the family deity of the Cholas. And these were intended as Utsava Murti or festival processional icons, whereas the Shiva Lingam was uh, worshipped as an aspect of Shiva in the main sanctum. And the temple also has beautiful images of Shiva and consort Parvati on in various um, iconographical formulations on the walls of the temple. And we also know that the queens, apart from other royalty, also made a lot of donations to the temples, the Nampiratiyar, as well as the attendants and temple dancers, the Nachiyar and so on, donations of lamps and bronzes and such like. Now, as such, not many metal icons, particularly of Hindu affiliations, are inscribed, and hence there is a relevance at looking at how the metallurgical profile can serve as a technique of fingerprinting to better explore the stylistic attributions and dating, which I'll explain further on. Amongst the great masterpieces of Chola bronzes is the spectacular set of Shiva as Rishabhavahana showing his pastoral form along with consort Parvati. And typically, this would have been accompanied by Rishabha, the uh, Vahana or vehicle of Shiva, which is Nandi, or the bull. And uh, you can see here very clearly that the base had the holes intended for procession. And the example in the Tanjavarat gallery is very naturalistic and hence is one of the great classic masterpieces of Chola bronzes with the hair in this uh, very pastoral kind of turban. And you can see also the inspiration from uh, the stone sculpture going back to a ninth century depiction in the Nageshwara temple in Kumbakonam, where you see the form of Shiva as Ardhanarishwara bringing together the male and the female um, uh, connotations and you can see part of the image depicts the male resting on the bull and the other part the feminine form of Parvati holding a mirror in the hand and there is also the bull or the Vahana behind and you can see that this formulation also inspired the beautiful Ardhanarishwara of the 11th century from Thiruvangaru which is one of the great masterpieces of uh, Chola bronzes showing Shiva and Parvati conjoined. Well, Ananda Kumaraswamy wrote of the Panchakritya or the five activities of Shiva from 13th century Shaiva Siddhanta texts, where he spoke of how the drum held in one hand associated with Srishti or creation balances the fire of samhara or destruction held in the other hand. And this visualization is also surrounded by the Prabhavali representing the cosmic cycles of creation and destruction as Shiva dances on Apasmara, who embodies ignorance and is also described as Muyalagan in the Tamil texts. And this is a very spectacular image of Nataraja in the Kankoda Vanitavam. Uh, provenance in the Government Museum, Chennai. And next to it is also the fine Natraja, which actually inspired Ananda Kumaraswamy, which is uh, from Thiruvalangaru, although the Prabha for that image is missing. And that image also inspired the French master, Agas Rudan, who was also inspired by Ananda Kumaraswamy's writings. Um, one of his well-known sculptures is the Age of Bronze, and he uh, described the Nataraja bronze as something divinely ordered or, or ensures the Vimo Regle. 
And the five activities of the Panchakritya uh, are also represented in this depiction of the dancing uh, Shiva Nataraja. And the analysis that I had made of this particular bronze using uh, inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectroscopy indicated that it had 8% tin and 8% lead. And this is typically also what is described as Ananda Tandava balancing the furious dance of destruction with the sense of bliss or Ananda with the leg extended in this particular karana known as Bhujangatrasita, which I will return to later. Well, the Nataraja image in stone and bronze seems to have come into its own also in the early part of the 10th century through the magnificent efforts of the remarkable Chola queen and patron Sembian Mahadevi in the earlier part of the 10th century. And these are images which are found in the Aditurai temple, which was built by her. And there is also an inscription in the Aditurai temple mentioning the artisan communities, including the bronze workers. And Sembin Mahadevi was uh, renowned enough to have a town named after her. And images of her was also cast and taken around in procession, as indicated by an inscription of Rajendra in the earlier part of the 11th century, mentioning offerings to her image. And I put in these slides to also show the connections whereby the Nataraja in worship in Aditurai has some elements of comparison with the stone uh, flying locks. And uh, so we can see the inspiration and the connections between a stone and bronze. However, I will come to how I already see the Nataraja bronzes having been formulated prior to this uh, period even. Well, the celebrated uh, bronze of uh, Devi in the Freer Gallery of, War of Art has been thought by some scholars, including Ananda Kumaraswamy initially, to represent the widowed uh, Chola Queen Sembian Mahadevi in all her regal bearing. And you can also see that she wears the sacred thread associated with learning. Well, this is a hypothesis, but uh, it is an impressive bronze. Now, the tradition of lost wax casting of metal icons uh, is still thriving in the small town of Swami Malay in Tanjavur district, an age-old tradition. And you're seeing here some photographs from the workshop of Radha Krishna, Shri Kanta, and Swami Nata Sapati, uh, well-known hereditary family of icon makers. And typically the lost wax process consisted of one where a wax model is first made of the image to be cast, and then it is invested with numerous layers of clay to form the mold. The mold is heated and the wax is expelled. And then the metal to be cast is heated in a crucible and poured into the mold so that it fills this hollow. And then the mold is broken open and it is finished very intricately these days also with a lot of fine ch chiseling and so on. And here you can see how beautifully the traditional method of using the palm frond or the odiole or ole is used for making the uh, measurements of the icon. And this is a bit flexible and it can take markings. So it's used almost like a measuring tape in three dimensions to form the proportions of the icon. The lost wax process is also mentioned as Madhu Chahista Vidhana in various Shilpa texts. And the reason why it also thrived in this region is because of the very fine silt and alluvial clay of the Kaveri, which formed the molding material. And you can also see here the model carved in wax with the numerous channels because um, bronze or copper bronze is not very um, fluid as such. So the channels help to improve the fluidity of the metal. Um, and these Shilpa texts also mention the different layers of clay which are to be added to make the mold with the finest grade being next to the wax model. And once it is covered with the numerous grays of clay, there is also an allusion to the form of the womb in a way, because it is described as karu, which is the term in Tamil for the womb. And when the icon is cast, it's almost like a birthing process. And there is also a lovely metaphorical reference to the casting process in the Tamil poetry of Andal, 
the mystic woman saint of the ninth century. In the Nachiya Tirumori, she likens the downpour of rain from clouds to the metaphor of the release of wax from the mold in the process of metal casting and evokes Lord Krishna as a skilled craftsman. And she says, Ulle ulle, Melugu Riki, Venkala Mutra, Vari Seva the Pole, Maraya Yunaku. And you can also see what happens when there is not a very uh, well made mold. What can happen is that the mold material can get impregnated into the casting, and that is what has happened in this defective uh, 13th century casting of Vishnu from the CSVMS Museum which I had analyzed and uh, found also to be a Lotan uh, bronze. So as an archaeometallurgist, uh, what I had undertaken was that now when we talk about the uh, techniques which could be used to date metal artifacts, of course, radiocarbon dating can be used with um, artifacts which have charcoal and organic material. However, bronzes are inorganic, uh, metal is inorganic, and there is no absolute method of dating. But what one has done is to use a relative method whereby we calibrate the metal uh, profile using certain techniques. And uh, to begin with, some representative icons from well-known museums were analyzed by a simultaneous multi-element analysis technique for 18 elements, which included the major elements, copper, and these are often leaded brasses or leaded uh, bronzes. About 80% of South Indian images were leaded bronzes, where because copper is not very castable, lead is added to make the casting more fluid. And uh, so here what I've done is looked at the uh, various profiles and the trace element content is, of course, below about 1% um, of the composition. But uh, what is interesting is that some trace elements, such as nickel, arsenic, antimony, bismuth, and cobalt, tend to be a bit chalcolithic. Chalcophilic means that they tend to, um, when they're chalcophilic, they tend to cluster based on the copper source. And hence, there were certain um, uh, coherences found in these various stylistic groups based on which some reassessments of not so well dated bronzes were also made. And then these were grouped into um, pre Pallava or Andhra Pallava. Uh, Pallava, pre that is the pre Pallava group, is before about 600 CE. Pallava is between 600 to 875. Um, and then the early Chola or the Vijayalaya Chola is about 850 to 10. 1070. And uh, what we describe as the late Chola is broken here into the early Chalukya Chola and the later Chalukya Chola, which is post the Imperial Chola period. And uh, then there is also the interim between the Chola and Vijayanagara period, which is described as later Pandya and so on, and the early Vijayanagara and then the later Nayaka periods and so on. And these were also consistent with another technique I'd come to, which is described as lead isotope analysis. And here, as I was talking about the runners or the wax channel, sometimes they are left intact, as in this beautiful image of Somaskanda of the Pallava period, which was also fingerprinted to the Pallava period. And I was talking about the leaded bronze uh, composition, and you're looking at a microstructure above of leaded bronze. Now, although the South Indian images are often described as panchaloha of five metal icons, they don't prominently have um, five metals alloyed, which of course would not make practical sense. Um, but I would say that there is an addition maybe of traces of um, uh, silver and gold if the clients uh, wished it during the process of casting as mentioned by the uh, uh, great Stapati families that I've interacted with. Now, the technique that I mentioned of lead isotope analysis can be more powerful than trace element analysis because trace element analysis, of course, depends on the clustering of the copper sources. But uh, the lead isotope ratios can be distinctive for different ore sources because of the fact that different ore sources have a very uh, unique uh, and measurable uh, 
history of formation related to the um, uh, uh, the measurable proportions which are related to the uh, uranium thorium cycle and so on and what that means is that uh, different ore sources will have distinct lead isotope ratios so that one can at least use it as an exclusion uh, principle that if a metal artifact has lead isotope ratios which are very different from a particular ore source then that could be excluded and for example, here we find that this beautiful um, couple of bronzes of Buddha from Kanchipuram in Tamil Nadu and this one, one meter high Santinatha image, which is inscribed to 1236 CE, which is a Jain uh, Tithankara. Both of these had lead isotope ratios which matched the Ambaji mine in Gujarat, which helped to authenticate uh, the Santinatha to the Solanki period. And it seems that this metal was also coming here for the making of this um, image in Kanchipuram. And both these are actually brasses of about 21 to 24% zinc. So there's use of brass here, which is um, interesting. And this particular Kanchipuram Buddha was also fingerprinted by me to the uh, later Pandian period, which matches with this 13th century dating. So there are these internal coherences. Of course, we do know from uh, metallurgical studies that the region of Zawar in Rajasthan was a very early center for production of metallic zinc in the 12th century. Uh, but these uh, did not actually match Zawar, but it suggests that there is another uh, uh, center also which is producing a brass, uh, maybe not uh, directly metallic zinc, but perhaps cementation brass, which is produced by a slightly different process and so on. But I don't have too much time to go into it. Now, coming back to this notion of, uh, you know, the geo heritage, which includes mining heritage and excavation and so on. I also put in the slide of the Rani Kiva, which is a step well attributed to the celebrated uh, uh, Solanki Queen in Gujarat of the 11th century, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which also gives you a sense of the skills in excavation and so on, which I think also is, is, is required when talking about mining heritage and such like. And at the bottom is an old copper working from Andhra Pradesh, which I had studied, which had a galena, which actually matched the lead isotope ratios of a couple of Shatavahana silver coins of the first to second century. So these had been mined already in the Shatavahana period. And another interesting aspect, since I talked about the use of metallic zinc, was the find of a Deccan zinc coin ingot with Deccan Brahmi inscription of about 4th century, which is one of the earliest known uh, examples of metallic zinc in the world. And this does not actually fit the lead isop ratios of Zawar, which I had mentioned. And there is also a votive brass bowl from uh, the Krishna Delta in the BNA, which I had studied, which actually matched its lead isotope ratios with 13% zinc and 8% lead and 10% tin. So this early source of metallic zinc, though we don't know which it is, was seemingly used in some of these Andhra Pallava artifacts. And coming back to the early historic bronzes, I was also able to identify a specific example of an early historic bronze, which could be from southern India, which is this beautiful Yakshi with the goose, also in the VNA, which uh, did not fit the lead isotope ratios for the northern Indian bronzes. And the trace element trends were also consistent with uh, this idea of an early historic group from um, the deep south. And uh, if you see the stylistic connotations as well, it matches other early historic um, depictions of the feminine form, such as this beautiful relief of uh, the dream of Maya related to the birth of the Buddha from Amravati, Andhra Shatvana, 2nd century, and another Yakshi, uh, Shatvana Yakshi. And there is also this fine um, pot shirt from Arikamedu of the first century, which shows a lady with a um, mirror, which is, of course, has an Indo-Roman context, but it has certain similarities there. And the largest scatter plot, which I had shown in that earlier uh, slide, was then uh, looked at more closely, the South Indian bronzes were broadly clustering in this particular way. And then when we look at it more closely, we see that there are distinctive clusters related to particular 
styles of bronzes. The Chola bronzes are tending to have lead isotope ratios clustering in this ellipse one and the Vijayanagara bronzes in the ellipse two. And likewise for the late Chola pieces and such like, which then, as I will point out, that is because there is some uh, local coherence in the ore sources used, the lead sources and so on. And there were also similar coherences in the copper sources, which uh, the, as you see from the combination of the trace elements and the lead isotope ratios, uh, because of the fact that it seems that at different periods, such as Chola and Vijayanagara, there was particular lead and copper sources used, which were quite uh, distinct, which I then tried to use to discriminate between these um, bronzes. And these are two very uh, fine examples, which we can agree are high Chola bronzes and also have been fingerprinted to this period. One is the Somaskanda from Nidur, the Parvati image, which had Chola fingerprints with 12% uh, tin and 8% uh, bronze. And uh, uh, of course, tin also was added to make bronze more fluid. And the other is the Velankani Nataraja, which is attributed to Raja's children by some art historians, and that also uh, with 5% lead and 4% tin, this was also fingerprinted to the Chola period. And you can see the similarities of this Velankani Nataraja with the celebrated bronze of Ardavalan Nataraja uh, in the Brihadishwara temple. Um, and you'll also see that the the stone version, in fact, has this coil serpent and actually connecting the knee and the hand because, of course, stone does not have very good um, tensile strength. There is also a strut there to prop up the, the leg, whereas the bronze form had a better trans tensile strength. And hence, this image really seems to have come into its own uh, in the medium of bronze. So this is how technology also, in a way, influences certain iconographic formulations and such like. There is also an inscribed image of uh, Shivakami from Karaviram, which had a pedestal inscription of 917 CE of Parantaka Uma Bataraki, which is a bit similar to the Somaskanda image here, to point to the fact that this is one of the rare inscribed uh, images. Well, um, I was talking about the hollow casting and the solid casting techniques in the sense that the Chola images are generally made of uh, solid casting, where, as I was showing in the workshop, first the wax model is made of a solid piece of metal and then it is uh, covered with numerous layers of clay so that the casting itself is of solid metal. And here we've used a radiography technique on this particular Vishnu image of the Pallava period, seventh century, which had been technically fingerprinted to the uh, to the Pallava period, and you can see that that is a well-made solid casting. And there are these other affiliations with Pallava sculpture, such as at Mahabalipuram, the slanted attributes, and of course earlier to this, you see that there is also the use of the hollow casting technique, which would have come in from Hellenistic influence. You see the uh, in that particular technique, a core would have been made of clay and then a thinner layer of wax would have been applied so that you get a thin layer of metal in the final casting. And that's what you see in this hollow cast of Alokiteshwara, which was found in the Krishna Delta and now in the Victoria and Albert Museum, which I had also studied and which was attributed to the Andhra Pallava period from fingerprinting. And it had 12% lead and 9% uh, tin. And this style also, of course, influenced Southeast Asia, and there were already these maritime connections which carried over into the Pallava period. And you can also see that that style of Vishnu of South, South India also influences the Khmer Vishnus. And there is this example of a Vishnu from South India where the attributes are also connected in, in stone because, as I was mentioning, the bad tensile strength of stone. And you also see that in the Khmer version. And that also reminded me a bit of the runners, interconnected runners that we saw, for instance, in the Pallava Somaskanda, whether that idea came from the bronze casting technique. Well, Nagapatinam in Tamil Nadu was also a um, fine spot of many beautiful bronzes of Buddhist affiliations, almost 350 of them. And Raja Raja Choran patronized the setting up of a Buddhist vihara at Nagapatinam by uh, the Southeast Asian Sri Vijayan kings uh, who were from the region of the Malay archipelago. And um, 
one of these very fine ones of the Buddha seated on this throne with uh, the fly whisk bearers and was actually fingerprinted by me to the High Chola period, the Rajajajan period, I would say. This would probably come be of that period. And in the next to it is a fine image of uh, a gilt Buddha from Nagapatinam, which was technically fingerprinted to the late Chola uh, or Chalukya Chola group. And that um, also actually perhaps fits in with the style there. And this image is actually uh, very finely made by mercury gilding. And that's also why it has a very low amount of lead, about 1%, because uh, lead uh, is low melting and would have interfered with the gilding process, which is made by using a mercury amalgam with gold. Then it is heated or burnished so that the mercury sublimates, leaving the gold layer. And this image, you can also see the stylistic inspiration from the spectacular holocaust, a life-size Sultan Ganj Buddha from Birmingham of the late Gupta period of about 7th century. It's now in the Birmingham Museum. And uh, that has a similar robe to the uh, uh, gilt Nagapatinam Buddha, um, although that was made by the holocausting technique. Whereas the, this and the other image next to it, this beautiful Tara image of Patni Devi found in Sri Lanka, which is the British Museum, these are both solid casts. And interestingly, this Tara, which is found um, in Batikolawa, which is in northeastern Sri Lanka, also had lead isotope ratios which matched very closely this Nagapatina Buddha, suggesting that the lead sources were similar. And of course, although this image is found in Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, it suggests that there may have been some connections also with the Tamil region. And of course, Batikolawa on the northeastern coast uh, uh, did have contacts also with the uh, mainland Tamil region. And it's also interesting that that particular stance of this image of the Tara, the gilt Tara, with the bent knee and the bhanga is very similar, of course, to the Chola depiction of Devi's, which is very markedly seen um, in this beautiful life-size Nageshwara Kumbakonam image of the ninth century. And also in other uh, early Chola images, such as in Tandan Totem of the 10th century, the beautiful uh, consort of Rishabhavahana. And I had also technically fingerprinted this sampled Chola Parvati from Thiruvengi Malay, also to the early Chola period, again, a uh, similar stance. Whereas perhaps the Tara images that you see in Sri Lanka are slightly more um, erect in the standing form. And also you see the silver Tara, which is seated. So I would say that there may be a syncretic confluence there of Sri Lankan motifs or similes along with the Tamil and so on. And I should also point to this beautiful gilt Lokeshwara in the Manjunatha temple in Kadri in Karnataka, which is inscribed to 968 CE. And uh, this is also a very fine gilt bronze. So it tells you that uh, the gilt Buddhist images were also being made in southern India. And on the top, you also see it has the similar uh, depiction of um, uh, a small deity within the hair locks, which uh, you also find in some of these uh, Buddhist images from Sri Lanka. So pointing out that in southern India also, there were known to have been uh, gilt Buddhist bronzes. So uh, this idea of the connection with uh, uh, the Sri Lankan region is not far-fetched in that sense. Well, one of the very interesting aspects of study uh, from my research was also this question of uh, going back to the writings of Ananda Kumaraswamy, whether the formulation of the Shiva Nataraja was in, in fact inspired by some observances uh, of the uh, celestial uh, phenomena, so to speak. And you see here again this beautiful image of Shiva Nataraja with the flying locks, which has Ganga and the crescent moon and so on. And uh, there is a very remarkable uh, uh, context here because there is the uh, there was a lot of, of course, basis for astrology and ritual and so on. And the Chidambaram temple known as Dilla in, in the olden days uh, is the one shrine where the Nataraja image is worshipped in the sanctum in the anthropomorphic form, as well as the Akasha Lingam or the element sky. 
And this temple has this very remarkable festival in December called the Marguerite Thiruvadare, where the constellation Orion appears overhead in the uh, uh, night sky. And uh, it has also um, been pointed out that this there are certain uh, texts, such as the book by Chakkalingam in Tamil, which uh, had been pointed out to me by Raja, late Raja Dikshitar of Chidambaram, which also shows a, um, an illustration of Arudra Tandava Darshanam of the star positions of the Orion constellation uh, being shown to be reflected in the iconographic formulation of that Raja. Of course, only with the Orion constellation and not the other stars, but that was there in this uh, particular uh, page. And also the late Ganapati Stapati, who was a master stone sculptor from Mahabalipuram, also mentioned that the Nataraja icon should be visualized within the stars that surround the red star Thiruvadare, which is the Alpha Orionis and connected with the star of uh, Shiva. So in a collaboration with the late astrophysicist Nirupama Raghavan, we had explored this idea and I just put this star chart onto this uh, 11th century image of uh, Shivanath Raja, which we think is made in the earlier part of the 11th century from the technical fingerprinting that I've done. And you can see there that the Orion uh, position, star positions of BTGs and Bellatrix and the belt of Orion are coinciding uh, with the body. And interestingly, the leg, the lifted leg is pointing towards the star Sirius. Now, this has not been mentioned by any other star, uh, by a scholar. And the star Sirius is also, of course, known as Mrigavyada, going back to Vedic sources and um, also has some connotations with Shiva, which also brings one to the um, interesting notion of whether the formulation of this particular imagery of the lifted leg uh, which is so typically Tamil and not found elsewhere, whether this was also connected to this kind of visualization of uh, Orion and the star positions of Sirius and so on around it. And just another interesting aspect is that, of course, in the mid 11th century, in 1054 CE, the Chinese astronomers observed the uh, Crab supernova explosion on July 4th, 1054, which they recorded very well, where it was uh, very bright and visible, almost like another sun, even in, in the daylight. And the questions have been raised as to whether at all it had any um, uh, significance in terms of having been observed and recorded in the Indian subcontinent. And of course, although it is uh, still speculation, there is an interesting uh, aspect that 11th century, mid 11th century inscription points out that the festival of Ani Tirumanjanam, which is still celebrated in uh, Chidambaram, was begun in uh, the mid 11th century when the moon was full in the Uttara Nakshatram. And this falls sometime in the earlier part of July. And in fact, um, it is also interesting that, of course, this is when a Brahmotsavam is uh, actually performed. And when we actually um, look at the position of the star, uh, the crab supernova, it is somewhere towards the, uh, the, the, the towards Taurus and the uh, top part of the um, uh, this imagery, if, it, uh, if, if we could call it that. So, of course, and even before the supernova explosion, it would have been showing some dimming and brightening. So it's possible that it was uh, visualized or seen even uh, a few uh decades before and could have formed this part of this visualization of the Nataraja image, which of course is seen more in the December months than in the summer months. And just to point out that this particular bronze, um, uh, stylistically also there are certain um, reasons to believe that it was not made too much after the period of Rajendra Choran. Um, and this is the image from Gangai Kondachorapuram showing the headgear with the skull and the crescent moon, which is also seen in this uh, Nataraja bronze and with the third eye. So uh, the dating of this bronze would be not too far away from, uh, let's say, the Gangai Kondachorapuram, uh, which was completed before uh, uh, 1040 CE and so on. So this bronze is somewhere in the mid 11th century. So uh, it could have uh, some connection in that sense. And uh, 
Of course, Nirupama Raghavaman had also pointed out that some sculptures um, of uh, the Kanchipuram temple, the Pallava stone sculptures of Kanchipuram, had some connections also with uh, Orion um, and the star positions. And this particular uh, uh, correlation between a Pallava sculpture of Shivanatraja dancing on Moyalagan was one that I have made. It was done independently after uh, she had expired. But this was interesting because it also shows that, uh, for instance, Moyalagan is described as lapis. Uh, in the Greek, uh, I mean, well, Moelagan actually translates as hair, and hair is um, also what is depicted by uh, the lapis in, in Greek, which is the rabbit. So there is this connection between Moelagan as a hair and the term used in the Greek, the lapis, uh, when it comes to depicting Orion and the star positions around it. And you can see here also the, the way in which um, you know, the uh, positions are correlating with this particular depiction um, in, in a much more uh, integrated way, the depiction of Orion and the, the, the hair or Muela then in Lapis and so on. And uh, another interesting aspect from uh, my studies was that the uh, Natraja bronze itself had been formulated probably in the Chola, in the Pallava period, predating the Chola period. And uh, of course, a typical depiction of Nataraja is what we describe as uh, this formulation with a leg extended in what we describe as the Bhujanga Thrasita Karana um, and, uh, or the serpent fried Karana as it might be translated. And you already see that being formulated in um, Siyamangalam in the 7th century in a Pallava depiction over there. And you see the serpent as well below it. But in the earlier formulations that you see in other parts of India, it is mainly other forms of the dancing Shiva with uh, Udva Janu or uh, Chatura Tandava as seen in this magnificent example from Badami of the sixth century with all these multi-armed formulation. And uh, there is also a Pallava Natesha image in Udva Janu, which I had technically fingerprinted uh, and found it to be consistent with the Pallava period. And this is from the fine spot of Kuram, which is also associated with Pallava era inscriptions. And this image from the British Museum was also fingerprinted by me to the Pallava period. And uh, al although it uh, had been earlier thought it might be slightly later, the Chola period, but it is confirmed from the technical investigations to be of the Pallava vintage. And both of these images, the Kuram Natesha and the uh, British Museum Natraja, have this forward-facing dwarf and several other iconographic uh, features which fit the Pallava group, such as the loop sashes and so on. And uh, another interesting aspect of as to why these star positions might have been noticed and so on, we know that uh, stars were also used in navigation and the Cholas and the Pallavas were also great navigators sailing east. And the Arabs also were using the star positions such as uh, Bella Drakes and so on uh, to sail east. And the Egyptians also, of course, observed um, Sirius, um, and which was Oris Osiris, so that has a certain uh, long historical background as well. And it's also possible that the Arabs were involved in, in the trade in tin, as suggested by uh, some records, and um, perhaps some of the tin may have been coming from Southeast Asia, but I've also pointed out in other studies that actually there was some use of perhaps local tin also, which may have come from some sources in Karnataka. So, of course, that idea of actually finding the ore sources, and there is actually more evidence for uses of local sources as well, um, because another important um, source of copper is also found in Sri Lanka and Seruvala. And uh, it could be argued that that might have been one of the sources, but that is actually found to be a copper magnetite deposit. And uh, quite often the Sri Lankan images have some traces of iron in them, whereas the South Indian images, as I had shown in the earlier uh, analysis, had very little in terms of traces of iron. So it's possible that the copper sources were distinct, and I have pointed to some other studies of copper sources in southern India, uh, in Tamil Nadu, in South Arcot district, and Ingaldal, and uh, Mamandur, and Agni Kundala, and such like, and Tintini. And I've also tried to show that 
there was a, dis a discrete source of copper also for the Vijayanagara images, which might have been in Tintini in North Karnataka. Now, the Vijayanagara rulers were also very uh, dynamic, and uh, there was a lot of revival of temple building and bronze casting. And uh, uh, one of the uh, very important images, which was fingerprinted from my studies to, to the Vijayanagara period, was this Rama, which is in the Gov in the Victoria and Albert Museum uh, now. And it is also shown with a bow. And of course, Rama is one of the avatars of Vishnu associated with uh, forces of preservation and so on. And uh, this image was also found to have a 21% zinc and traces of cadmium as well. So it could have been from uh, uh, zinc, which was used from a source of metallic zinc. And in the Vijayanagara period, you also see the coming to prominence of the worship of uh, Ramachandra uh, as Rama with this full-fledged temple. And as you can also see, there is another depiction of the Rama with the bow. And interestingly, this Parvati image or Devi image uh, did not fit the Chola fingerprints, but fitted the Vijayanagara era fingerprints. And actually, if you look at it closely, you'll see that the styles of the dress actually fit more closely with the Vijayanagara era. So that is how the fingerprinting can help us to tell apart uh, the bronzes. And then you also have this fine uh, portrait bronze of Krishna Devaraya of the 16th century in the Tirumala temple, where Krishna Devaraya is depicted with his hands folded. And you can also see the harking back again to the Chola motifs, such as this uh, chieftain of South Arcot, which is fingerprinted to the Chola period or Rajendra period perhaps, of, uh, which had a low amount of, uh, which is a low leaded bronze, 3% 3 lead and 4% tin. And of course, this uh, celebrated masterpiece of uh, the portrait bronze of Krishna Devadaya has the cap in more of a uh, Persian kind of style, the kulai, uh, rather than the crown seen in the earlier uh, uh, in the deities and so on. So it shows the cosmopolitan influences in this period. And um, since I was also mentioning Southeast Asia and Cambodia or Cambodia, there are also other interesting connections between the Tamil country and Cambodia. And this is a very uh, intriguing relief from Biantishra in uh, Cambodia, which depicts Karekala Mayar, the sixth century Tamil woman saint, who is said to have hailed from a merchant family in the coastal port town of Karekal. And uh, she is, of course, usually depicted along with the dancing Shivanataraja as seen in this other beautiful uh, image, which is of the 10th century from Tirunageshwaram. And she prayed to be turned into an old hag so that she could accompany uh, Shiva on these uh, dances in the cremation uh, grounds where he dances with goals and so on, and this destructive uh, 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 dance of destruction and so on. And she, her poetry talks about how he effortlessly bears the fire in his palm. And he's often depicted like that with the fire in his palm and the beautiful dancing one and so on. And there is a lovely image of Karekalamayar, uh, which has been attributed to Sembian Mahadevi, the 10th century um, in Thiruvalangadu by uh, Nagaswami, where she's shown playing the symbols. And that is also seems to be the inspiration for, for this uh, Khmer depiction of Karekala Mayar. But it's also interesting that there is a bronze that I studied uh, and fingerprinted to the later Pandyan period around uh, 13th century or so, 1300 CE. And that image of Karekala Mayar, which is in the VNA, also had 20% lead and 3% tin. And you can see here is a hag playing the symbols. And it's interesting that this image also depicts Karekal Amayar with fangs. And those fangs are also found in the Cambodian version, although it's not found in the early um, uh, Tamil uh, version as seen uh, of the Sembian Mahadevi period. So there are these uh, interesting motifs which seem to be going back and forth in different ways from the Tamil region to Cambodia and so on. Well, I'll come to the final interesting point, which is that, of course, I mentioned that a lot of the bronzes were uh, low leaded tin bronzes or brasses, but there were also other types of uh, alloys which were in use and in vogue in southern India. And there was also a skilled tradition of making metal mirrors of a specular composition of bronze, which uh, 
uh, optimizes the presence of a delta phase of bronze, which forms at about 33% tin. So these heightened uh, delta bronze uh, mirrors were made such that this very highly reflective properties of this bronze could be optimized to get a very brilliant um, mirror image, almost as good as a modern uh, mirror, which has the mercury backing and so on. But this has a point reflection because uh, this is a, uh, uh, you know, the, the normal mirror has a thin layer of glass and then at the back of it, the mercury coating, which causes some refraction, but this has no refraction. It's a point image. And you're looking here at the microstructure, which shows that it has got a predominant presence of the silvery uh, delta phase. And uh, although this alloy is very brittle, a special way of making the casting using a close, close crucible mold process was followed. And then the very thin blank was cast so it could be very homogeneous. And the casting process minimizes the defects and then it is very highly and skillfully polished to get this brilliant mirror surface. Now, why it's also interesting here is um, I had studied one uh, particular mirror example, which is from um, Travancore, which has the insignia of the Travancore royal family with the Gandaberundam or double-headed eagle motif. And uh, of course, Gandaberundam is also seen in uh, Mysore and elsewhere. And this is typically dated to about uh, the 18th century here. And this particular uh, mirror had uh, almost pure uh, microstructure of uh, specular bronze, uh, you know, with almost uh, entirely consisting of crystals of delta bronze and very little of the eutectoid phase. So that, so this implies it would have really been having the best possible specular effect and even to create uh, pure delta crystals like this in the laboratory conditions is very difficult. But what is also interesting is that the copper, um, uh, well, the analysis of the trace elements, the chalcophilic trace elements actually matched the uh, copper sources that, uh, uh, I mean, matched the trace element uh, profile that was associated with the copper sources of the uh, 18th century later Nayaka and Maratha period images from Tamil Nadu, including this Garuda with the Naga, which is in the VNA collections. And uh, this has got a very typical later Nayaka style in a way. Uh, and you can see the beak of Garuda and the wings and the Nagas that he's battling. And again, of course, the uh, coincidence of the connection of the Garuda here. So it's possible that around this time, there were similar copper sources which were circulating widely um, in the subcontinent and, and in southern India. And also, of course, the uh, mirror making tradition, they also point to a connection with the Tamil regions. So even today, the Acharis of uh, Aranmula in Kerala, where it's made, they point to how they had ancestries from Tamil Nadu. And it's also interesting that the temple in Kerala, the Aranmula Parthasati temple, which is dedicated to uh, uh, Krishna, another of the avatars of Vishnu, um, and Garuda, of course, is also the Vahana of Vishnu. Uh, they also follow, of course, the ritual of the Utsava Murti procession of the festival icons. And here, this photograph shows you how the icon is actually being carried on the head of the priest. So there are these many different ways, and this seems to be one of the more archaic ways of uh, the uh, processional icon being carried around. And of course, in the Chola times, and, and also what we see in the present day in Tamil Nadu is the large icons are carried around on the bamboo poles and so on. Well, there are also these very beautiful verses, such as of uh, uh, Appar, who sings of this connotation where he says, the Lord of the Little Chamber, referring to Nataraja or Thillai, uh, Kutan who dances in Thillai, the Lord of the Little Chamber filled with honey, with fill me with sky, nilavu, and make me be. So the sense of the sky um, or the connection between the cosmic and the human and elevating uh, oneself through this mode of dance, I think that is something which is a very universal idea. And... Uh, there's also a beautiful verse of Manika Vajikar, which uh, says, mm -hmm. The one who is without beginning or end, the one who is the top, the bottom and the middle. So this sense of, uh, you know, sense of infinity that the image is 
uh, thought to convey and which seems to have been captured in some of these mystic verses as well, apart from the other kinds of imageries associated uh, with this image. And of course, the subject is also very vast, as you can see. Um, you know, the more one studies, the more there is to find out. And there's still a lot more to be done in terms of clearly identifying sources and um, uh, uh, fingerprinting and such like, but it's a very um, rewarding study. And these are some of my publications, including uh, one which had been put together by the IGNCA, which had two of my articles, along with one of uh, the celebrated uh, Ananda Kumar Swami and the Dance of Shiva. So in case you're able to get some of these. And uh, of course, Acknowledgements to so many institutions and individuals who it would be very difficult to 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 name them all now, but uh, 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 many thanks to them, and again many thanks to the India International Center for this wonderful opportunity. So thank you, and I shall take leave of you now, and uh, all the very best. Thank you. <laughs>